All right, folks, I think it's live. I'm not really used to that. Randy's not working with us today since it's not on the official car channel. You sure we're live? <laughs> we're live, son. Good morning, everybody. Thanks no, for being here. Be big, must be Much appreciated. Uh, I have Chuck and Jim helping me out because I don't like to do Good these morning, things everybody. solo. Thanks for oh, for God's sake, what was that? Gosh, Jim. Nothing. It was nothing. Yeah. Move on. Nothing to see here. Hey, Hollywood. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about manual antenna tuners, uh, specifically a couple MFJ products. I got a uh, 949E about a week ago, and uh, I wanted to share. So we're, we're here today to talk about it. I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do with it. We do have some slides that we're going to go through. Uh, before we get started, did you boys have anything you wanted to say, add, contribute? I, I, I grabbed my MFJ. Happy we, Sunday. We have there. That right looks marvelous. You want to see it? Let me move my mic out of the way. Yeah, let's see what you got. Mine's, mine's the one for the uh, what was the what was the uh, tuner you had, Jim? The the MFJ. One? I had the nine ninety three. B. He didn't have that. No, the t not. Excuse me, the uh, amp that you had. This is for the amp that J Jim used to have. Oh, oh, the Amer the eight eleven Ameritron. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the Versa tuner three. That, this is for that, the. I uh, gotta say, for a manual high, tuner, that's kind of ham sexy. I tell you what, it's not as smooth as my Palstar. Is that a Palstar? Palstar. I have an A2, AT2K. This part's not as smooth. The rotor. But this thing tunes really well. I mean, Todd is tithing actually, at the Church of Ape. I can tune it faster, I think, than my Palstar. You got a, you're going you're gonna to drop the bass on them or something? Yeah, I was making make sure this is your Thanks, show. Todd. I didn't know if you wanted to do the things. I'll do the things. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And in honor of it being a little early. We'll not go with the trumpets. We got the lieutenant colonel in here. We're actually going to look in the insides of a couple of these things. And then I just wanted to say thank you, Country Jim, for becoming a member. Much appreciated. Yeah, he that was in the chat when I logged in before anybody was wow. even here. I was like, that's Country Jim. Yeah, he did that like midnight. Awesome. All right. I, I have to say, I tune mine a little bit different than you were showing on yours because I never read the instructions. But uh, I just set mine at, fifth, at like half and half on the two on knobs. Yeah, they said to put it. them both on low on capacitance, and so you want them fully yeah. open and then. No, mine were, or, or whatever half is. Yeah, that's half. And half. usually, and That'll usually I don't move it much from there. Tell you the truth, I use the and they uh, say the to use, tune one. the inductance first for the for the lowest possible right. SWR, right. then do the radio side, and then do the antenna side. Mm -hmm. But if you watch like YouTube videos where people are like, "Boy, I'm going to show you how to do this," and you know, they, everybody does it different, and they all swear they're doing it the right way. The one thing that you want to make sure you don't do—that's awesome. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel LCN. Um, I, I love that antenna. But the the um, thing you don't want to do is you don't want to push too much juice through there with too high of an inductance and potentially get some arcing in there, right? Like that's uh, that's that's what they say. Anyway, I've taken mine out with that. Yeah, um, oh, I I never can remember the name. That shortened uh, doublet that they sell. And it worked. Yeah, so with that even. I, I was always a. Uh, you know, disciple of use a use an automatic antenna tuner because it's fast. It's easy, right? You don't have to mm -hmm. do anything. You just you know change frequencies, key up, and it's done. But I, I'm changing my mind to I want to do more and more work with the manual antenna tuners. I think that they're probably a little more efficient. I think that they're probably a little wider um, capable in terms of what you can tune in and what you can't tune in, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can probably go a lot deeper and miss if SWR mismatch. So when you say wider, so for example, my the only MFJ tuner I've had, I think I, I might have had one other one, but I, the only one I remember is the 993B, and it would tune like up to 2400 to one mm -hmm. out of whack, which is basically you're transmitting into a shoe. But when you say wider, you think a wider range than something like 2400 oh, yeah. to one. Yeah, like so, I th I think that there was well the one MFJ said it did fifty to one, right? So that would be twenty five hundred, right? Okay, I think mm -hmm. that if I'm doing my math right, it's still. And I might be now, wrong on the on the nine ninety three. It might be higher. I I just can't remember. It's been a couple of years since I've used it. I have both, but when I was running power and stuff, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from um, Gary W nine N F B W nine FMB, 
And his his theory was if if you if you're running say a thousand watts in one of those relays, let's go. Now you're now you're not tuned or something. Mm-hmm. Whereas a manual tuner is not really going to change unless you change it. it. It can't arc, but once you have it tuned, it shouldn't arc. Oh, you're now saying in an automatic tuner? An auto tuner, yeah. 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 There, there's just more things that could maybe go wrong when you're running some like some high power stuff. I don't know that he ever had that problem. It was just his thoughts, and so it may be right or You're talking wrong, like a but, stick shift versus an automatic transmission. A whole lot yeah, more parts I mean, in an automatic transmission. Yeah, and there's more to go more to go wrong. I mean, if it uh, if it does let loose, now I do like the auto tuners are nice. I have to tell you, with that Poseidon, I'm I'm liking it because it's when I do FTA, I just I just tune it wherever you know and and go. But so Hollywood was saying that MFJ labels are knobs backwards, and he says higher numbers mean less mess mesh. Totally counterintuitive. And so here's the we're going to take a deeper look at this a little bit later in the video. But here's the MFJ 901B. You mm-hmm. can see this knob is set to one, right? And this knob is set mm-hmm. to six. So if you take a look, one is fully meshed, just like he's saying. And then six is, om- well, if you go all the way to six, is is pretty much fully open. Um, so he's right. What, what are you saying? He's not, he ain't lying about that. You, you doubt? No, never doubt. No, 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 no. I just wanted to show everybody what, what, he, was, <laughs> uh, what he was talking about there. So typically so, it would be the other way around. One would be, would be fully I, I open. I would think... I would think that one would be fully open. So I, I to- totally agree with what he's saying. Huh. Right. Since I got the overhead camera on, here's a, here's a little, this is a two gang um, capacitor. Right now it's fully nice. meshed. And if I turn that, then it's, it's fully open. So the piece that's moving is called the rotor. And then the piece that sits still is called the stator. I don't know if that matters for anybody out there, but I thought I would do a little anecdotal, whatever out there. Lee is uh, Lee is asking, have you measured a man, manual tuner with a nano? I have, and so I don't think I'm going to do it today, but I'll probably do one on the the new nine. Uh, what is it? The nine forty nine E that I just got, but I have, and so I've measured like insertion loss and everything. A lot of people, you know, get upset and say the tuners cause all these efficiency problems, and you get a lot of loss. Eight, eight, eight for a second. Your audio just like you talking now. You're not smooth just, and buttery. I guarantee it's my freaking there, internet. There you go. It's better now. But um, a lot of people were saying that the manual tuners, or, or tuners in general, are inefficient, right? So you, you get a lot of loss in the tuner. And I did do a video a long time ago with a manual antenna tuner measuring insertion loss at different things. And it's true. You do get loss uh, as a product of heat inside your tuner, but I don't think it's as as bad as everybody says. And the, the other thing that I would say to people is, is that, um, you know, if you're worried about it, turn up the wattage, y- y- you know what I mean? More power like, captain. I, I, yeah. I, I just think that, you know, with well, amateur radio, then, there's so many I think compromises. I, I think I circumvent it a little bit with using, doing a doublet cause I'm not using coax. And I tell you what, people are surprised a lot of times and I tune for 40 and stuff that I'm only running a hundred Watts a lot of times at the distances that it does work. So, and I mean, I don't know. What kind of, I, what I like kind of insertion double. loss did you see? A- I, I don't remember. I really don't, but, but it wasn't enough for me to, to worry or panic about or anything like that. Uh, so, so less like, than three for sure. Oh, for sure. I'm thinking it was like one and a half, maybe. Okay. All right. And so like you get these people who get all worked up over efficiency, but they're using like the worst, Cat, there were worse coax. uh, coaxial cable that you could find where they're, they're you know they're using terrible connectors and, and mm-hmm. you know where their antenna is not mounted 100 percent correctly <laughs> and, and i'm just like yeah. i don't understand why people get so wrapped around the axle on that i think that was a shot across the bow there Abe. <laughs> that's a good one all right well let's do a little bit of this uh dave slide stuff to get a, uh, officially kicked off And so some folks uh, might be new watching this. And so they're saying, well, what the heck is even an antenna tuner? And like some people get upset, even call them an antenna tuner. So some people call them an antenna matching unit or a trans match. And I said, it's a device used in amateur radio to match the impedance of the transformer output to the impedance of the antenna system. An amateur radio radios have a, a system impedance of 50 ohms. 
And what we see is antennas have something different than that. Uh, what you can get is a condition called standing wave ratio on your transmission line when you have a mismatch and that can cause you all kinds of grief. Unless, of course, you live in Florida. I don't, I don't think where it, it just is. bounces back and forth and actually creates energy. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, what antenna, antenna tuners do is they help ensure maximum power is transferred from the transmitter into your antenna. Uh, minimizing signal loss and improving overall transmission efficiency. I've got a bunch of videos on SWR if you want to learn more about that. But essentially, when your signal reaches your antenna, if there's an impedance mismatch, which there is, even I'm telling you, I'm going to kill this cat. <laughs> you're driving, you're driving me crazy. We got, we got, we got He's a already cat been on it. The cat earlier, guys, before we got he on. He was the, so. saying bad words to that cat. He was. He was. He was cussing it out. Um, I forget where I left off. So a lot of hams, and we'll take a look at where people place antenna tuners, put the antenna tuner in their ham shack. So you still have that impedance mismatch with your coaxial cable and at your antenna. And you do get reflections that come back. But what you want to do is you want to have the tuner protect your radio from those reflections coming back. Because reflected power can cause all kinds of havoc inside your radio, including damage in your finals. And I think somebody just earlier was saying that right. they had that. So... And my thought on that is exactly what you're just saying. It, I can buy a new $150 antenna tuner a lot cheaper than I can buy a new $1,000 radio. Yeah, but when you take a look at an antenna tuner like this one, there's no finals in here, right? right. So, um, but to your point, if you smoke a tuner, it's a whole lot less dramatic than if you smoked a 7300, for example. Right. Um, so with an antenna tuner, what we do is we adjust what's called capacitance and inductance, and they are um, components of an AC circuit. So a lot of times people think about resistance, and resistance is a concept for uh, DC current, and then it's called impedance when you're talking about AC current. And so impedance, is we'll talk more about this, is made up of a resistive component and then an imaginary component, which is how that circuit behaves at particular frequencies. Antenna tuners are really useful for multi-band or wide-band antennas where you have impedance changing over a set of frequencies. So if you build like a resonant dipole, for example, its resonance really is at a single frequency. Potentially, you could have it at multiple frequencies depending upon certain conditions, but they're not in the same band. And if you like to band hop or move around, or if you operate on a wider band, like, uh, I don't know, 80 meters, you you want to have the ability to maybe adjust your your SWR, and that's what antenna tuners are, are are good for. I know plenty of people will have one one antenna for a particular frequency or something like that, but most hams I know like to jump around. And the ATO is like a lever or seesaw, allows you to balance each side. Think of an adult on one side and a kid on the other. Move the fulcrum, and they're balanced. Exactly, that's a really good way to put it. Um, then I have tuners can either be manual or automatic with automatic tuners, being able to quickly adjust changes in frequency or antenna configuration. It probably would, Jim. Yeah. Um, so, um, like we were saying earlier, automatic antenna tuners, um, do, do seem to be a little faster. Chuck swears he's faster than an, than an automatic antenna tuner with his manual tuner. Well, there's tricks, there's tricks to manual tuners. He got some trickery. Yeah, you set you set it all up and put a list out, and you don't have to. You, you can. The doublet's kind of weird because if it rains, because I use the three hundred ohm stuff. Right. If you if you make your own, the bigger stuff, it, I don't think it affects it, but rain does affect it. So I'm, I'm, if it's raining a lot, I constantly have to change just a little bit, which is the worst. But I mean, we haven't seen rain here in how many years until last year, so I never affect, it never really affected me. But what I do is I'll go through. And I'll, I'll set a chart up for each band, and mm -hmm. usually somewhere in the middle. So then like I just tune in an amp almost. I'm, uh, on yeah, the amp. amp tells you where to start, right? Yeah. The instructions. So basically, you get there, and usually it's usually. I mean, if it's good today, three days from now, if it's the same type of weather, no rain or anything. It'll be the same. It'll be close. So you think and it's really weather it dependent on a doublet. Well, with the okay. yeah, with the, with the open wire with line, the doublet. It, yeah, okay. it, it, it is because uh, you have all the with water the open in wire. there. Yes, getting finicky. with the three hundred. Yeah, okay. The three hundred yeah. ohm, I think, is more susceptible to to the to the rain than like the four fifty or the the. If you, eventually, I probably will make my own. 
some big stuff, you know. Well, back in the day, I think the the most common or most recommended antenna is a doublet with a manual tuner, and you still right. get a lot of the OMs still recommend that. Um, I, th I think you know, with newer hams like us, we get all infatuated with things like NFEDs and stuff like that. But but well, still people got the think doublet. people think ladder line's really hard and. People make it out to be really hard, but I haven't seen. I mean, yeah, you keep it away from metal. Uh, mine's wrapped around the the fence over here to kind of keep some of the slack out of it, so it doesn't <laughs> blow around. It works just fine. I mean, and then I, I ran it in the house, and then I I do the common mode joke. Um, I bought one from my antennas years ago. That <laughs> what I found out he is I bought, bought the a one common that goes mode to, joke. Why are we still talking is, with Chuck? This was years oh ago. God, man. Years ago, man. Wow, you have to replace I knew, that. Chuck. Before, Actually, it's just it's nice. It's a nice tube. It just fits nice, and uh, and then you run a little short piece of coax. You know, you you want to keep your coax short, and I use nope. good coax for that one. Cheers, like, Adam. Like four hundred. <clears throat> Daniel saying, does Zygu sell a tuner that they put into the G ninety standalone? As far as I know, the answer to that's no. I don't think Zygu yeah, sells any it. standalone tuner. What does that G sock do? Wasn't that a tuner? Or is it? That's no, that was like an interface. Okay, like that's a control a unit. Thing. Okay. Look at this. Uh, was country a, Jim I think it was a fail, wasn't yesterday. it? What did you buy, Jim? Yeah, we want to know what you bought. Oh, man. So uh, I'm talking about antenna tuner placement on the slide. And what you typically would see is a radio SWR meter and a tuner. Uh, most of the hams I know have a tuner that's mounted in the ham, sh in the ham shack. You can put antenna tuners at the antenna, but... Today we're talking about these manual MFJ antenna tuners, so we're not gonna we're not gonna cover that. I, th I think I did a video called uh, "Buying an Antenna Tuner," and in that I cover that that topic. But a lot of folks will say, "Well, where do you put your SWR meter when you set up your station?" And this is what I understand as the recommended configuration. It's what I do: radio, and then I have an SWR power meter. And a lot of folks say, "We well, already have that in your radio. Why do you need to put that there?" I don't know. I just have bad eyes, I guess. And I like having an external SWR and power meter. And so, then what that tells me is there's a, what my, how my antenna tuner is working. What I like though, personally is like my, my pal star and my MFJ both have a meter in them and they're pretty accurate. So yeah. I don't have to put anything else. I know the pal star is I've checked, I've tested it to my Daiwa and it's like they're dead on. I've checked it to the radio one. See, I don't do it that The way, radio though. ones are so, so you I don't do, do it with, with I, do, I put the tuner, radio tuner meter. So the tuner is right after the radio, and then what I'm seeing on the SWR meter should be the true reflected power and forward power coming in and out of the wire. Now there's a, and there's a slight difference between sure having the the meter in front of the tuner or behind the tuner. And you can see that if you use, like, like we're talking about, with a radio with an internal tuner, and here with my setup. So I have the flex tuner and the flex amp, and I'm not flexing, I'm just saying. Well, you should be able to measure your loss, right, that's going through the tuner yep. In, yep. in that case. And you get a slightly different reading between the two SWR meters, because the amp has an SWR and power meter, obvi, and so does the tuner. So they're not the same numbers. Um, yeah, I would imagine. But also... But they're they're also looking at the a, a different circuit, right? Yes. So, like your amp would be looking at a circuit that includes the tuner. The tuner is looking at a circuit that just includes transmission line and antenna, right? Right. So, I, I, and I've seen where people have one on either side of the tuner as well, mm -hmm. so they can compare. But the one thing we go back to the efficiency nerds. Everything you put in in between your radio and your it's antenna. Loss. Yep. Your, is a taxed, right? Um, er, er, all of it is. Ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So a lot of people say that the antenna tuner doesn't tune your antenna. And I'm kind of of that camp where I think that the only way you can really tune an antenna is by physically manipulating the characteristics, such as how it's mounted or the length or the height or anything like that. And then there's a camp of disciples of Walter Maxwell who wrote the reflection articles that's in the book Reflections. And he makes a pretty compelling argument that the transmission line is actually part of your antenna and the tuner does, in fact, tune the antenna. But to me, it all just sounds like opinion, not not fact, right? 
the only thing I really care about is that my tuner allows my radio to see a matched impedance and I can operate without potentially damaging my radio. So I don't really care what people call part of the antenna or not part of the antenna. I don't care who's famous ham you follow and what their opinion is. Um, I think we all agree that they do the same thing. They match impedance, right? And then so whatever you want to call that is terms of an antenna. I, I don't really care about that. Yeah, well, I mean, and you didn't say the word, so I'm going to say it. You can get quite pedantic yeah. with the whole topic. And in the end, it, it's going to work just fine either way. It's not specifically, in my opinion, it's not my opinion. Is not specifically better one way or the other with that with that kind of arrangement. It's you know whatever. Yeah. So just a quick picture. This is the this is the bit, the tuner that we're gonna we're gonna look in this one. We're gonna look inside the guts of another one to talk about how they work. But that's the nine forty nine E Versa tuner two, and I just got a brand new one for two fifty. So I'm pretty pretty excited about that. Although if, in retrospect, I What's, might buy the. F. I think there's another version. Like mine only go. The one I bought only go, goes from 160 to 10, and they have one that goes to, all the way up to six. I'm a little disappointed I didn't do that. Oh, you know, for six, a lot of times your antennas are usually pretty much resonant because you're using. I mean, if you really get serious about six, you're using you're, you're not going to use your nine to one. You're, you're, you know, yeah, not usually. <laughs> so just not quickly, if you're, not if you're serious about it. Right, right. So I wanted to quickly go through. Uh, you're right, Dan. Everybody nitpick everything. Um, so what is SWR? It's more co correctly referred to as uh, voltage standing wave ratio. And what's funny is, is I was talking about this in a different video, and somebody gets all crazy saying that you can also measure SWR via current. It's called ISWR. And I, I told him, I said, you're, you're absolutely right, because it's a ratio, and you can just measure voltage or, or current to, to get it. But almost every, in fact, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen in, uh, I know I have it in person, an SWR meter that measures current versus voltage. But um, we're just going to call voltage standing wave ratio and that one guy can just piss off. Um, it's yeah. a measurement of impedance between a transmission line and an antenna. Um, SWR is expressed as a ratio. And so, for example, if somebody says, I got a two to one SWR, that means they're looking at a 100 ohm to a 50 ohm match because 100 is two times 50. And we talked a little bit about what impacts SWR and so I can't antenna size. Um, so antennas are designed for specific frequencies and their physical length is tuned to match that frequency. Now, in some cases, people use loading coils or they'll use traps or they'll use different the capacitance hats, for example, to kind of manipulate the electronic characteristics of an antenna uh, without adjusting its physical length to match different frequencies. And, um, Looser bad connectors, like this is something that gets people all the time, is a lot of times poor connections or corroded connections between mm -hmm. the transmission line and antenna can cause an increase or decrease in impedance, which can mess up your SWR. Um, bad or damaged transmission line. If transmission line such as coaxial cable is damaged or deteriorated, my lawn guy hit my coaxial cable and chewed yeah. it up really bad, and it made my SWR crazy, so I had to replace it. Yeah. Remember yeah. TOs uh, last year, year before last, he had some he kind had of some weird, chewing on there. Yeah, the, yeah, rats or squirrels, squirrels or something or rats, eating his yeah. antenna line outside his house. And we have antenna location. The location and height of the antenna can also impact SWR. Uh, an antenna installed too close to the ground or in an area with significant RF interference can lead to higher SWR readings. The other one is, is like, so if you mount your dipole over top of your rusted out El Camino, that El Camino is conductive and it can impact um, your antenna, mostly from the way that the radiation patterns work, but it can also impact it from an SWR standpoint as well. I would think a rusty El Camino would increase the ground plane. It, it would make it cooler. That, that's for sure. I'm, I'm just saying, cool. yeah, pop a six, a Bud Light, <laughs> put on some Skinner. <laughs> right. So the wind make, blow back your mullet. Yeah, we talked a little bit about impedance. And so what makes that water. up? Uh, we have resonance is when there's no reactance, which is almost never. And so reactance is either capacitive or inductive. And it's the behaviors of that, that impedance at frequency. So the, the um, impedance equals resistance plus reactance. So resistance is the true ohmic resistance of, of your circuit. In the case here, our circuit is transmission line and antenna. 
there's a formula. We're not going to go over formulas today, but it Z is the symbol for impedance. R is for resistance. And then JX is a symbol for reactance. So in case you see it anywhere, the formula is Z equals R plus JX. Um, reactance is dependent upon frequency. So as you try to transmit different frequencies through an antenna, your reactance is going to be different at each particular frequency. And that's when I say resonance is when there's no reactance, which is almost never. So if your antenna is 100% resonant on 14074, right, at 20 meter FT8 frequency, and then you adjust your dial and you go up and you want to talk in the SSB portion, your your reactance is going to change and your antenna is no longer resonant. Right. So it's like a little bit of a pet peeve of mine when you hear people stoically tell tell you, I only use resonant antennas. Well, they're full of shit, right? Because they only use one frequency, right? <laughs> right, right? They only use X, wherever X is the best. <laughs> right. Um, and then they just have capacitance is measured in farads, inductance is measured in Henry's. For the matter for ISWR, you can measure it as a ratio of heat or bare, uh, bare field. field RF amplifiers use witness with an inductive amplifier. VSWR is accepted common language. Yeah. I would agree. That's if, if you, yeah, and I think what he's saying is you can measure all sorts of ratios related to an antenna system. But when we, as hams, when we, when we send even the CB guys, when we talk about SWR, we mean VSWR. ISWR is a measurement that like three people in the world use probably on a daily yeah. basis. The rest of us, no. Right. Would agree. And so the antenna tuners that we look at have something called a T network inside of them. And, um, there's Z networks, Pi networks. There's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can tune a circuit and they're called networks. When in amateur radio tuners, one manual tuners, one of the most common things that you'll see is a T network. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons. They're simple, right? So they're, they're easy to work on. They're easy to tune and they're very, very wide banded. So they work across a large range of frequencies. Now, one thing about a T network is it is not real. It's a, it's a high pass filter. So that means that when you have you have it tuned at a particular frequency, everything higher than that will pass through that network. So what it does not do is it doesn't work as like a bandpass filter where it would attenuate harmonic frequencies at higher frequencies. Um, so that's a little bit of a get you um, if you have something that generates like spurs and stuff like that. So you'll see even T networks inside your radio, but then you'll typically see like a bandpass filter uh, after it in between the T network and the antenna. Um, I just said this configuration of components used to match impedance of any antenna system. That should make sense after everything we talked about. The impedance of the transmission or receiver consists of three components arranged, or arranged in the shape of a T. Um, it's one component in series between uh, two in pair. I'm sorry. It's one component connected in series between the transmitter and receiver of the antenna and two components connected in parallel across the transmission line. These components are typically variable capacitors and inductors, and that's what we're going to look at. Um, it provides impedance transformation by adjusting the values of the capacitors and inductors to achieve a desired matching. Um, and then it just helps to maximize power transfer, and we covered that. So here's a picture that I got from hamradiosecrets.com. So thank you to the folks at hamradiosecrets.com. You have full attribution for this picture. And... The line across the bottom is your ground, and then the line across the top is your center conductor and your transmission line. And the symbols that you see, C1 and C2, that's a symbol for a variable capacitor. So this is typically what we would see in a T-network, is a capacitor on the radio side. Then you would see some sort of inductance coil uh, going to ground, and then you would see a capacitor on the antenna side. Now, you're not going to have a variable inductor in the middle of the T network though. That's going to be a fixed value inductor. <laughs> well, the, the, so what we have in these tuners are, are called tapped inductors and not roller inductors, but they, they do, they are, they are variable. And so it's a good call okay. because that is not the schematic diagram for. Uh, that's why I was asking. I was like, mm. yeah. cause we just looked at in at that, that stuff yesterday and I'm like, yeah, that be a variable. So, um, we're, we're running short on time, so I'm really going to blow through these. So YT networks, they're they're flexible. They allow for a wide range. Um, they're efficient, and so you don't have as much loss in them as you may have in other other networks. 
Um, I think I mentioned earlier, they're simple. So it's a simple design, easy to build, easy to work on. Um, and then adaptable, they, they can be adjusted or tuned to accommodate changes in operating conditions, uh, different frequencies, different types of uh, antennas. So they're, they're, they're just very flexible and that's why they're so popular in these types of devices. <clears throat> Here's the diagram from the manual for the 949E. And we're gonna look at one live, but um, they have a variety of different inputs on the back of them. Uh, so where you see in this diagram, the transmitters on the bottom and you, you go out and then into the transmitter, um, uh, SO239 on the tuner. And then you can have different types of antennas hooked up. So coax one, coax two, two different antennas fed with coax align. You can feed a single wire uh, antenna with using the five-way uh, banana, I guess they're called banana jacks, I don't know, or balanced line. <clears throat> and the main binding, reason I wanted to show this is, is that, what's that? Binding, binding post. post. Yeah, binding post. Um, if you take a look at the ground on the MFG 949E, it's bonded. So that's what that's called is when you bond these two together, um, you have that bonded to your transmitter and then that runs to ground. So when you bond stuff together though, it's a good idea to bond everything to a bus bar and then run the bus bar to ground. You don't want to hook it up in series, right? You want to have all your stuff bonded in parallel is the reason I was showing that slide. Now this might be a little bit uh, tougher to see and um, but you can see the T network. So if you draw a line straight down the middle of this and then look immediately to the right, you can see uh, the T network and this one, shows how the in the mfj it is a tapped inductor so you have those little points at each each thing yeah. the different squiggly squirrelies as it goes down um we're going to walk through the insides of this radio so we don't spend too much time taking a look at the um the schematic and i wanted to show the schematic for the other tuner but it was really really hard to see it was really blurry so um that's it for the slide so hopefully everybody's still with us not uh See a shooter. Shooter's on his way to church. No, he thought you were on your way to church. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I was going to maybe take mine apart, but because I have the roller inductor in mine, but it's it's about twelve screws or something for that thing. I, well, let me. MJ um, gets screws for cheap because they love to use a lot of screws. There's a ton of screws in that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I took it. Took my the case off mine today and had six screw, eight screws. I think is what it was. Let me. I got, uh, four, on each, got, I got four, four on each side. <clears throat> and four on top, so that's twelve screws. <laughs> Let me see. If and I don't, I do I don't have my little gun in here. So. Okay, you got it. I was going to say I'm going to make your screen bigger. So uh, the boys were just talking about this is a this is a roller inductor, and so this is the knob that you would turn. And as you, as you turn, roller inductors are nicer than tapped inductors, and they cost more money. They make your tuner cost more. But as you turn this, you're never going to be able to see it. But inside, not here, but inside, there's a little thing that sit. It, it's right here, but you're not going to be able to see it on the inside of this coil. And as you move, you might be able to see this bar going through here. As you move this, it changes the length of the coil from where your input and your, your output are. And the longer you go, the more inductance you have, the shorter you go, the less inductance you have. But in this tuner that we're going to take a quick look at, this is the um, one we were looking at earlier. It's the 901B. It has a tapped inductor so you see the coil here and it has all these fixed positions that are on there and then as that i change beautiful, this and that's a t network all day because there's your two capacitors yeah. on either side with the inductor in the middle yeah so as i change the inductance value here i'm selecting a different point on the coil for the amount of inductance that i'm going to have in the circuit and so let me just beautiful. zoom in a little bit on here and see if i can do this right the roller ones are set up a little different the roller is usually off to the one side i'm gonna ape i'm gonna put you full screen on that camera yeah okay so, we so this better. is the guts and let's take a look this this jack here is the transmitter mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so you can see the center conductor it's, it's just grounded through the case so there's no ground coming off of here but you can see the center conductor comes down and it goes into our first component which is the capacitor right so it's just like it just like in the picture of the t network and then you get a capacitance value based off of the 
relationship between your stator and your rotor here. So as I go fully mashed, I get or fully open, I get less capacitance. As I go fully mashed, I get more. And then on the other side of that, this this uh, capacitor, we have another tap, and you can see this this wire just runs straight over to the other one, right? And then this same kind of circuit, and it goes down, and it comes down, and goes right out this coax connector, which is what would go to my antenna. But there's also split here. So if I wanted to use a single wire or a balanced line, mm -hmm. it's tapped there. Now, in between the connection, like I so said, the top of the T between the two capacitors, I have this wire that comes off and goes into my induction coil. The coil's connected to the various values that are here on the rotary uh, knob. But then down here at the bottom, you can see my coil goes to ground. So this is the bottom of the T, and then those two parts are the top of the T. And it's really simple to see in this particular tuner, which is why I wanted to show it. It's a really, really simple tuner. Um, <clears throat> Ken saying what's under the black disc. So if you if you look at the black disc, what this is, it's a four to one Ruthal voltage on on. And you typically use those to balance the signal that uh, to go to, it to go from an unbalanced. I'm sorry, I called it a non on and it's a balance. So our, the antenna that you would use for this is on this balanced line. So you'd have a balanced antenna, but the circuit on the inside is unbalanced. So you use this to achieve the balance in, in, um, in, in your, in your transmission and your signal. And then you can see it's tapped, it's center tapped and it goes to ground over here. Let me see if I can get that in there. Now, which, which right tuner there. is that? Which model tuner is that? Abe? This is the 901 B. Now, is that uh, is that a hundred watt tuner or it is a hundred watt tuner? Okay, and it might even be higher than that, but it's a pretty simple tuner, and I think these are around one hundred and twenty five bucks, give or take. Um, they've been around the, forever. It, that's uh, the one like my little. Um, yes, it's, here, huh? it's almost exactly the same as that one. I think, but, but actually, yours is not that, an MFK. I think though, right? mine's no, mine's the um, the Heath kit. I think it's. I think that's a copy of the Heath kit. Is what it. Originally. MFJ is is uh, very commonly known for doing that kind of thing. So I here's think, I think your capacitors are bigger though. So it, mine says fifty watts for mine, but I've been told it'll take a hundred sideband. But uh, this is the new one. Yeah. So this is the um, this is the new one, and I said we'll take a look at the front of this. So this is the Versa Tuner 2. It's the 940. Oh, this is the 949F. I thought I ordered the 949E. I'm a big dummy. No that must be. Uh, what a dummy. That That's why I got it so cheap. Because when I saw this, I was like, what? I can't believe that's the price on that thing. And it's because it doesn't go letter. all the way up. Uh, it doesn't do and it six. does have the smaller capacitors in it. It doesn't go to six. Yeah, those is that what capacitors. you were saying, Nate? Yeah, it doesn't go to six. Okay, so it's the F. I could have swore I bought the E. Oh, well. Um, I'll live. But this one's got a lot more features in it. So let's, let's take a look at it. Um, one is it has an SWR power meter, which is awesome. So Chuck was talking mm -hmm. about how his has one. So, so much in the easier. diagram that we looked at, you, you could use this uh, for tuning, and you don't necessarily need another component along your Yeah, that's, and that's a cool line. feature of a lot of tuners. It has a lamp, so you can turn this on or off if you if you want, but you don't need to have the lamp on. You don't need any electricity in this thing in order to use it. Um, it has settings sure? for, th yeah, it has settings for 30 and 300 watts. Um, here's the antenna selector, which is really cool. So you can go between uh, your balanced wire, your balanced line or your wire, um, coax one, coax two, but all the way down here, you see it's got a dummy load. So you can actually transmit into a dummy load if you wanted to do, that's already down. If you wanted to do some some testing, and then here you can switch between peak and averaging. So when you use something like single sideband, your power bounces up and down depending upon the amount of modulation that the radio is transmitting based off of the vo your voice. So some people want to see what the peaks are. So what, what your max output is. Some people like to look at averaging. I, I like to I like to look at averaging. So we looked at the antenna selector. So here on the back, just like the diagram that we looked at, you see a bunch of stuff. So here, here's the plug for the meter lamp, 12 volt DC. But the only thing that this does is turn that light on and off. You don't you don't need to use it. Here's the ground. The meter, I don't think the meter works unless you do that, though. 
No, it works. It worked. Um, this is the this is the ground lug, and then um, if you were going to use balance line, you would use these two. What do you call them? Binding post adapters. Yeah. Um, if yeah. you're going to use just a single wire, which used to be really common, I don't I don't know anybody who just sticks a wire on the back of these things. Then you do need to install a jumper between these two. They've changed those. Yeah, transmitter and then the coax for the two different uh, two different yeah. antennas. Um, Chuck, why don't you, you want to take Ken's question? Well, Ken, um, I think if you're going to run, they both work. I think for me personally, I trust a manual tuner if I'm running power more than I trust an automatic tuner. That's just me. It's, it's something in my head. But, um, and then like Gabe said, sometimes they're, they're a little more, they can do a wider range of tuning or matching. However you well, want to say it. probably the biggest thing though is, is that if you run a manual antenna tuner, you can act like you're better than hams who don't, right? Isn't That's that right. the word? <laughs> See, they've they've cheapened up on those because the old ones had the nice. Um, let me show you the back of mine. Can you hit me real quick there? Yeah, I got you. I don't know if it's but see see the bind the binding post on yeah, this. They're nice. not really binding posts, but they're oh, they're those licensed. are those that's what they used less to use. Ghetto than what's on apes. Yeah, so they've they've changed that. This is an older one. This one's about five six. What years show ago. the front of that biznatch? And that's a now much is, nicer tuner. What is that tuner, Chuck? Ninety. It's a nine six two D. That looks very pretty. It says one point five kilowatts. Never trust. What MFJ says on that, this was actually made for their four tube, the one that uh, the what are the 411, 911? 811. 811. 811. It's made for that. It's made for their four tube. It'll handle eight hundred watts. And I bought it because I have a. I think it was the smallest one I could go with for me for portable because I have a I feel like a five hundred watt amp that I can take, and that's why I bought it. I took it. I actually bought it when I went to Chicago one time. And the, the reason that you tune at lower power is so that if things are sideways, you don't immediately destroy your radio. That's, yeah, I would tune less than that. I would tune at maybe five to ten watts. Well, I you move your way tend up, to though. agree with you, except a lot of automatic tuners won't engage unless you're at twenty. So you need it. It, it depends. If you're doing a manual tuner, like we're showing here, absolutely mm -hmm. five or ten watts would be fine. But a lot of automatic tuners. Um, the LBG and, and the MFJ auto tuners require like 20 watts to engage. That's that's the problem I found out with the 705 with that that 100 watt one I bought from you, Jim. It doesn't like it doesn't it, really the, like. Yeah, the power 10 is watts. so low. Yeah, it wants 20, I think. Yep, it does, and it says that in the manual. I think that you what you, what you do really is do its dingus until you, you hit 20. You want to eventually you want to eventually get to whatever power you're running and tune at that, but work you can work your way there. Yeah, because it will change. You'll watch it, and as you go up, you can more you can tune it a little bit finer for the higher power. If you're going to run, you say you're going to run 200 watts, work your way up to 200 watts and tune it to there eventually. But work, but like Ape said, kind of work your way up a little bit in stages. And once you get it, once you get it at the lower wattage, it'll be pretty close everywhere else. Right. Yeah, it's typically not going to change a whole lot. It will, but not generally a bunch. And then you got to change your meter too. So make sure you change your meter or you think something's wrong. Right. All right. So let's talk about the guts a little bit. This is our dummy load. That, oh, that's uh, the dummy talking, load. Okay. I was talking about this is the same thing, the four to one ballon that we were talking about earlier. So this piece of connector here, this SO239, is, the, uh, is for the transmitter. And then you can see down here at the bottom. There's a little teeny toroid. Let me lift this up so you can see it. And that's the SWR bridge, that toroid, and then these components right here above it um, for how you would how you would measure your SWR. And that goes into here, into the SWR power meter. Now, or just like the other tuner, this comes out, it goes through. It, the other tuner didn't have an SWR bridge, but it goes into this SWR bridge. And then you can follow the traces, and it comes out, and it goes into this side of the capacitor. And then you can see I adjust the capacitor with this knob here. And let's see if this has the same condition. So this is fully open. And just like Hollywood was saying, 
it is 110, so fully meshed would be at zero, um, like he was saying. And yep. it cut the 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 other side of the capacitor has this wire that goes right over into the other capacitor forming the top of the T and this wire comes over here. It looks like it goes into the coil, but it's above the coil and it comes down and goes back into the board and then would go to your, your various antennas. Now this one's got this really long the rotary knob on here. It's got this really long shaft on it. And, um, that is for your antenna selector. If you wanted to turn that, this rotary knob here is for adjusting the taps on your fixed inductor. And so what's crazy is this one has this big coil on it, but it's got this little small coil over here. And so for the least amount of inductance, this the setting right here on the butt on the knob, and it goes right into the center of this little one. So you'd only get this little itty bitty bit hmm. of inductance. Now, the more I turn this knob this direction, the more and more inductance it adds as it goes. goes so down, down the coil. Yeah. Right. So these would be the top of the T right here. And then this connect, this connection coming in is our path to ground or the bottom part of the T. So let me flip it around. The T goes like this and like that. And that yep. would be, that, that would be your T. So that, that goes knob, on there. On that knob, as you add inductance, you're moving down that coil from top to bottom. Correct. Right. So, yeah. Okay. And I might um, point out that it's it's uh, grounded in, into the frame down, and there's also into the box. Yeah. Yeah. Just the like the, just like that right here, on either yep. on either side. Um, we had some questions about the dummy load. Can you hold that end up and show that dummy load? Dan was wanting to know what that was rated for. I assume 300 watts, since that's what it says on the front of the tuner. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the instructions, but it's it's rated at different wattages for different durations, right? So it's like you get mm -hmm. 10, and I'm just speculating here, right? So don't don't take it as gospel. So let's just say you get 10 seconds at 100 watts. You might get 20 seconds at 50, and right. then 30 seconds at 25 or something those like are, that. Those are tiny little capacitors in that thing. Yeah, you know, when I opened it up, um, I was like, what the F? Look how little these capacitors are. And that thing's supposed because to be I was looking at a picture. Watts? I was looking at a picture of the of the E, not the F. And um, oh, I think my <laughs> I little I think my little Heath kid has bigger ones than that. So you you think you got F'd is what you're saying? Well, I mean, it's just a different tuner than what I expected. But either way, this is fine. The, the the main reason I got this tuner is one I want to learn more about, and I want to use manual antenna tuners more. Uh, I want to do more videos like this, showing people the, you know, how they work and seeing them in action. You know, is this the only tuner I'm going to ever own for the rest of my life? Absolutely not. You, you know what I mean? It, to me, it, it doesn't matter too much. It was a toy and I got it at a good price and I'm going to have some fun with it. And whether I keep it or not, it's a whole right. other thing. Now, what are those blue components left of the long shaft? Are those dip switches or? Um, let's take a look I, at them. I, I, I can't tell what those are from here. Well, they, they are adjustable. And I do know that there's a calibration procedure that you can do for, to the, um, oh, for the SWR meter. meter. Okay. But, but okay. if you take a look at it, the SWR meter does have these calibration things in here. So there's little teeny adjustment points in there that you mm -hmm. can adjust. I believe that's for adjusting that. I'm not 100% sure what these um, actually do. Let's see if there's any markings on that. Hmm. So, so they look like they're very old resistors. Yeah. Same meters that, that is in my... Uh... AL80B looks like. Now you can pretty, say a lot of things close. about MFJ, but I will tell you that their boards are at least marked with part numbers, and you yeah. can discern a whole lot of information just from the markings on the part. Well, like if you look at all those solder points, they right. don't look bad. I I I've seen I've seen worse soldering on certain antennas. <laughs> yeah, so you know. <laughs> When you say 250 bucks for this, this doesn't look like $250 worth of parts. But I don't think it's a bad deal for this particular antenna tuner. And and I got to say that I'm thankful that companies like MFJ put stuff out like this that's affordable. And that given the simplicity of the configuration, mm -hmm. like Hollywood was saying, that people can work on this kind of stuff and change it out and, and do their um, – their own things with them. So I, I think they're, it's, I, I'm a huge fan of MFJ, of MFJ, to be honest with you. I've, so, I've used John, mine quite a bit. And I, I like it. 
Mine works really Josh good. Josh is saying those may be for calibrating the meter, the hold circuit, and the averaging adjust for the meter. It 100%, it 100 could be. I'd, I'd have to go back. Yeah. And, uh, Usually you don't mess with them anyhow. But Yeah. You'd have well, to read the manual. And that, you, that well, you'd also have to have so, some really I mean, just saying. high high dollar equipment to probably improve them at all. Well, and like Hollywood says, that's where you magic screwdriver goes, right? Mm -hmm. The golden screwdriver. The gold screwdriver, right, right. In your CB. And Jesse, I've, I'm with I've you. Used to, They're making that coil and solder in the boards. Hell yeah, take my money. I'm not going to do it. Now, you can buy this in a kit also. Is this the one you can buy in a kit, Abe? Now, see, that would be kind of fun to do it, though. i got to say. I, I, I repaired I one one time. I, have, I know they have a kit, but I don't know if it's the... Let me, let me look that up while you guys are talking. And that would be like a fun project if you're looking for something and you're and you and, and I think the coil comes tapped <clears throat> in that kit. I'm not sure. I think yeah, it's already, got a few minutes. I think so you may have to solder it to the switch. Huh. Yes, they do. Yeah. The nine forty one EK. What is yours? Um, he's got well, here's a the nine oh nine. Let me um pull up this web page. I've actually, um, my buddy Gary sent me one when I first started. He goes, if you get your, he goes, if you get your, your general license, I'll send you a, a care package. And he did. And that was one of the things he goes here, see if you can repair this. And I did, I gave it to my buddy cause I already had one. And, Jim, you uh, share that. I got it. Yeah. I got it up. See, it comes to, actually, it looks like it, is it, it looks like it actually might be attached. All the taps might be attached to the switch let me, too. Let me embiggen this a little bit. Um, well, that's well, the, yeah. That's exactly what that is. The, you don't even have to solder the tap and the rotary switch. It's basically just putting it together, and the board, I'm sure, is all together. You have some wires you have to hook up. You have to solder. Uh, you got components you're going to have to solder, and the meter. Oh, does it? Yeah. It's not too bad, though. No, this is, a, this is a fairly easy kit, and this is 300 watts. Recommended for the, uh, well, they're, okay, so they're showing other I would tuners. Probably, I'd probably keep it around 200. Pull up the um, 90. 4F. 904F. Is that what you have? Yeah. Oh, that's Nine, the one you wanted, huh? Not, I'm sorry, the 949F. I wondered what a 904 was, but I didn't want to question the ape. <laughs> if ape says it, it must be true. Okay, I don't want to join 279. you. 279. Well, there you go. If you take a look at that, it does go up to six. Right? Isn't that what it said at the top? Right here. Full 1.8 to 30 plus 6 meters. Well, hot damn. Why would you say it that way? That's weird. So you didn't buy the wrong tuner. It looks like I bought the right tuner. And then so, uh, this is 300 watts is what it's saying, right? Yeah. Uh, somewhere in here it said it. Yeah. That has a custom designed inductor switch. 1,000 volt tuning caps. Teflon washers and proper LC ratio gives you an arc-free, no worries operation up to 300 watts. It says heavy duty four to one ballon. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> so Hollywood, Hollywood, correct me if I'm wrong, but usually on MFJ stuff, if it says 300. I'd run about 200 into it. Usually they're a little over, kind of like antennas gain, you know. Like mine says 1500, but I would never put 1500 through it. How much are they charging for this thing? Two forty two seven. All right, so that's, that's what I paid for. It. I thought I was getting the e. I thought I was getting the e. Oh no, I paid less than that. I paid two fifty. Where'd you that's, buy it this, from? This is from them, though. I think I got it from. I want to say Ham Source, but I know that that's not right. Um, now the nine forty one e is two thirty nine. What see? What the hell's the difference here? So here's a nine forty five e, which is HF plus six meters for one eighty nine. Exactly. Okay, that's not got two antenna connections. It says 300 right? watts still, too. That's not yeah. a Versa tuner, whatever that means. That's just a mobile tuner. Yeah. Um, well, it's that to throw in your... Maybe that's just throw in your... That's a 945. Tuner. Yes. I know I'm looking at a different tuner. But it's a manual tuner. But this also doesn't have... This probably doesn't have... I hate their website. This... Like, ugh. Go to the 962. But see, I like that one better than the 921 or the 9201 that I was showing earlier because it has the meter on it, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I was looking for. 
So this looks like this is only. I'm just, gonna quit touching the picture. Just to his cart. Only one antenna. No, I don't. I'm not buying this today. Yeah, that only has one antenna out. So just one antenna nine, and no, ninety-two uh, and one. Yeah, and no uh, uh, balance line or anything like that. Which I like that. How, how much is that for one? a mobile? Is pretty good. One eighty-nine. One eighty-nine. I like it, but I don't like it two hundred dollars worth. <laughs> I I'm not actually buying it. Now, which one? What, Nine what six else two. Nine sixty two. Mine's a D, but I don't know if that's still a, a thing. James says he got a nine forty nine E for a hundred bucks used. That's awesome, man. Well, now this is two. Yeah. Look at this. This is the. Hmm. Which one is I that? I back up a page. Oh, that's the F. You back. That's up. the one. That's the one I've got. Yeah, I backed you up back, a page. Back Charles, up. tell me the number again. Nine six two D. That was a P. Damn it. D. Nine six two Delta. Used. Hundred and eighty. Yeah, bucks. I think they. I think they replaced this model. Maybe. Or no, actually, it says it's sold out. But. So this was the one. If you read in the someplace in there, it says it was made for their um, that eight eleven four tuber. It says it says hundred. It says one point five. I've never put one point five through it. Now look, this is like, this is like real ham here. No one could call you an appliance operator with this huge bastard. Good <laughs> right lord! I bet you, does this show the inside of that one. They might sometimes under the documentation you can look and see the uh, schematic. Yeah. Uh, I think it looked like no, I was going to no see joke. if we could find a nine sixty two that was new. It may. There you go, Chuck. The 962E. Yeah, I think they've I think they've replaced the D model. And it sold out, but look how big those capacitors are in there. Yeah. And that has the roller. I would call those heavy duty. Yeah, I would see. Do. This is the one that says compact MFJ handles 1500 watts PEP SSB, 800 watts. PEP SSB amplifier output. You have to read this. See, it says it's for the A11H. Yeah, and that roller inductor that I showed earlier, I think, is the one from this that tuner. Is it? Yeah, I think that's so. a pretty common part at Hamfest too. Is yeah, I've got a big inductors. one here that that, that um, Gary sent me, and a big capacitor. So I'm, too, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to build a tuner, a T network anyway. Um. So here's oh, a really small one. Things? I, did, I recently did a video on this. This is MFJ 9201. And I just wanted to show the, the guts of this one. Um, it's it's pretty simple. It's good. But they use they actually use a toroid, which is tapped into the induct, inductance knob here. Hmm. What size? Is that a 75 or an 84? It looks like a 120. It, okay, so it's a little bit bigger than an inch. I, I'd, I'd say that that's a 120. And this is a type 2. Uh, powdered uh, powdered iron core. Mm -hmm. It's got these little itty bitty caps, and this thing says it goes up to 100 watts, but I ain't so sure. Maybe 100 watts SSB, but I, I'm not I'm not entirely convinced of that. But that's uh, a nice looking wrap on that roid. Yeah, well, um, Good Game went to the MFJ factory and mm -hmm. actually sent me a video of their tow tow roid winding machine. Oh yeah, I've seen those things. They're cool. It's it's yeah. like a big sewing machine. It's it's really cool. All right. Let me get back to my regular view here. I'm going to hit that transition. Then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do this. And we're all back. Magic. And I think that's really going to probably wrap us up, right? Because I think we said we wanted to hit an hour. Yeah. That little tuner kit would be fun. I, I don't have a use for any more tuners. But um, I think that would yeah, be a fun I, project. Well, I don't have any manual tuners. I'm, I'm thinking about the tuner kit right now. Yeah, it would it's be fun. For, to, it would be a fun project for sure. What did it say? Three hundred watts. 300 Hollywood watts saying probably, ten, Hollywood saying probably. ten watts. I, I agree with you for this thing, Hollywood ten watts. But when I'm you read the instruction manual, the instruction manual says hundred watts. But it's called a QRP pocket tuner. So I, I my know. personal opinion is it's a typo. Um, but you know what do I know? Yeah, Marvin, I have the same one. The the difference I would say I would. The AT, AT2K, the roller inductor, and that thing is so much smoother than the MFK. 
Yeah, the, I can't the, say the, the, the tapped inductors like a clank, a clank as your turn. Yeah, on. and you're kind of like sometimes one is, you know, one's a little better than the other one, but sometimes once you get it tuned a little bit, the other one's a little bit better. And that's what's nice about the the rollers; you can kind of dial it in. Right, you can dial like it sometimes. In. Sometimes I won't touch the other two, and I'll just dial it in if I'm a little if I'm just a little off, which is nice. <clears throat> All right. Ken's asking if there's harder bands to tune than others, and I'd say no. The the, uh, the hardest band to tune is the one you're trying to operate on. I guess is the, <laughs> <laughs> the way to say it. All right, the, with that, the lower I think we're you go, wrap the harder the show. it is. Yeah, we're going to wrap up the show. Thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, thanks Jim and Chuck for being here. Thanks, it's much everyone. appreciated. And I'm hitting the button. See y'all next time. Later, all have a good weekend. Bye, y'all. The rest Seven of it. Three.